Good morning and welcome to this morning conversation, how can cyber defenders win? The answer is going to be provided by this fantastic <laughs> panel we have this morning. Uh, we have uh, Jürgen Stock, Secretary General of the International Criminal Police Organization, Interpol. Uh, next to him is Devjani Ghosh, President of National Association of Software and Services Companies from India. Um, and Sadie Kreese, Professor of Cybersecurity, University of Oxford, United Kingdom. Next to Sadie is John Doyle, President and Chief Executive Officer of Marsh McLennan, USA. And finally, we have Gary Steele, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer, Splunk, USA. It's the best name of the corporation that I've heard this morning, <laughs> Splunk, I like it. Now, uh, this session in many ways engages with the key findings of the Cybersecurity Outlook Report that has been published by the World Economic Forum. There were QR codes, I hope some of you have been able to download that report, but please do read that report. It has interesting revelations for all of us to consider. Uh, this is becoming a vital domain. Uh, the pandemic, the conflicts, uh, the economic opportunities all point to the fact that we are more digital than ever before. And therefore, we all, individuals and enterprises, must engage with uh, the potential risks, in fact, the real risks and the existing risks that confront us. Let me give you a few numbers from that report. Uh, since many of you are not going to download it. So let me give you a brief uh, insight. 70% uh, of leaders who were surveyed in that report stated that geopolitics has influenced their organization's cybersecurity strategy. So geopolitics matters when it comes to cybersecurity as well. And today we are in a world which is heightened uh, heightened geo geo geopolitics and weak multilateralism. And that lends itself to new risks. Of course, we have also seen that there is cyber inequity. Smaller companies, smaller countries are struggling to cope up with the dangers that the sector offers them. We have seen the number of organizations capable of minimal, minimum viable cyber resilience down by 30% in the last year. Now that's a big number. Companies are unable to keep up uh, with the cyber costs and capabilities required to respond. 90% of 120 executives surveyed at the World Economic Forum said that urgent action is required to address this growing cyber inequity. And maybe, Gary, I'm going to come to you on this particular aspect. Um, fewer than one in 10 respondents, now this is the most important uh, uh, finding. Fewer than, more than, fewer than one in 10 respondents believe that generative AI will give advantage to defenders. Many see AI and generative AI as adding to the threat landscape. And this is something that we will discuss as well today. And finally, one third of organizations have suffered a material incident in the past 12 months and say it was caused by a third party. So there are actors besides the state and the non-state who are going to do harm and you have to protect yourself against those. Now there are a number of interesting findings and I'm going to refer to some of those as we proceed with the conversation. But let me start with the, the global cop. Jürgen Stock uh, from the Interpol, and, and I'm delighted to be here with you again, Jürgen. And let me start with you. In this heightened geopolitical moment that we are currently confronting, how are countries harmonizing their approaches to respond to these threats uh, from an Interpol perspective? Are you seeing within the organization a growing appreciation of, of the challenges that we face today? Yeah, very good morning, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, represent here the global law enforcement community. Um, Interpol currently has 196 uh, member countries. And uh, m maybe to answer your question, uh, I should start by saying w w we are struggling. The global law enforcement community uh, is struggling with the sheer volume um, of, let's say, cyber-related crime, so high-tech crime, or the new types of crime which we uh, know from the past, like fraud, which is now entering into a new dimension with all the services that um, the internet um, provides. The crime statistics only know one direction, which is going up, going up dramatically in many parts of the world. And the tricky issue is the more resources law enforcement is investing, the more cases you discover. The more you are raising the level of awareness, and we have been making some good progress in raising the level of awareness, particular um, amongst uh, private sector, the more cases you discover, uh, discover. Cases that almost all have an international dimension that is challenging 
to a huge extent the classical model of investigation, which is done by nation states, um, who try to organize, who have their own legislation, their own rules, their own level of um, the capacity of skilled police officer, but you, you need to organize yourself not only with your neighbor, but maybe a police organization mm -hmm. on another continent in a, in a, in a situation where, of course, um, a particular law, law very often is missing. We have a number of member countries who do not have at all the necessary legal framework to investigate um, cyber-related crimes. And I would like to say we definitely have a kind of, if I may use that term, Champions League of Law Enforcement that is quite <laughs> successful to a lesser extent in getting the criminal behind bars and prosecuting, but at least taking criminal infrastructure down. Mm -hmm. um, we might come back to that point a little later, but let's say maybe 70 or 80 percent of our member countries are struggling, having at least a minimum capability to investigate crime. And of course, prevention is very important. The best crime is the crime that is not going to happen. But we, we have a huge increase. Um, uh, everybody in our communities is affected. It's not just the critical infrastructures. I have been a couple of weeks ago visiting uh, a rural police station in Germany, good old friends and, and, and colleagues, and they are telling me we are overwhelmed by cyber-enabled crime, and nobody is helping us in investigating that crime that most of the time has an international component. Mm -hmm. So that is a little bit the, the situation we are facing. Again, to summarize, Crime statistics only going up, and we only know perhaps perhaps we, we, we know eight or something between eight and thirty percent of all the cases are being reported to the police. All the rest is un not reported to the police, so we only see the, 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 the peak of the iceberg, uh, and that illustrates a little bit the, the difficult situation. And last remark: uh, uh, artificial intelligence. You said it advantage to the defenders. Currently, the criminals, of course, have been starting using AI to their advantage. And that will boost the situation. No, so fact, urgency me, is very important. No, let, me, let, me, let me dive deeper into that. Yeah. So can you, you know, you recently mentioned that, that uh, AI is undeniably a game changer for criminals and law enforcement alike. That's your statement. Yeah. Can you expand on some of the ways criminals are using this? I mean, cyber criminals are organized in a very different way that the way that, that I learned when I was a young police officer. We were dealing with a typical, let's say, traditional kind of mafia style crime. So people knowing each other, mm -hmm. um, so the same geographical relation, and, and so on and so on. So that, that was the principle. Now, the key word today, we all know that, cybercrime as a service. So the, the, the criminals mm -hmm. are organizing themselves based on expertise and, and, and uh, through the underground economy. They only know their, their nicknames. They get a certain rating, so a, a, a AAA perhaps, if they are providing reliable services. So this is the dynamic way in which they organize themselves, and you do not any longer need to be an expert. So e even perhaps I, as a non-tech person and a lawyer, I could conduct a, a denial of service attack because the tools are available for little money in the underground economy, and, and AI as a service for criminals is already there. So the, you, we all know these kind of deep fakes, um, this uh, phishing mails, more sophisticated uh, business email compromise, and we have seen now the first cases of a kind of um, kind of deep uh, kidnapping where uh, voices have been cloned and, and a family thought, oh, our, our daughter has been taken hostage, but it was a cloned voice at the end of the day. So that gives us an, an understanding what is coming up. So AI drives also scale, sophistication, and speed in terms of online crime. And the criminals are already there, and we are running behind. And that is not a good position, uh, not only for law enforcement, but for our communities and particularly the most vulnerable in our communities who might not have the resources to protect their, their own systems. You know, a, a police officer had once mentioned to me in India that uh, we are largely safe because most criminals don't have the competence to perpetrate what they want to do. So what you are suggesting is that an AI-enabled criminal is going to be more dangerous in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Also in terms of, of, of scale, the, sh the sheer dimension of the cases, Again, I mean, a, a classical criminal had to go from, from house to house for burglary, uh, from, from country to country. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you don't need to do that, and you get the help of technology, you get the help of artificial intelligence, so you could, can do everything from, from your sofa at home. Devjani, let me turn to you. Um, you know, Jürgen mentioned um, countries not having the capacity to keep up, sometimes not even having the legal frameworks. Um, there is a certain vulnerability aspect that... Uh, is discussed today when 
the largest chunk of the emerging world has decided to go digital for, for payments, for yeah. uh, governance, for democracy itself. Yeah. Uh, sitting in India with a country that is now betting on digital, it's growing on its uh, digital progress, do you see this as an opportunity or a threat? Um, a huge opportunity, but before I get into that, just adding to what you said, you know, one of the most innovative uses by cyber hackers right now is something called fraud GPT, which is, uh, which is actually a model built to significantly reduce the, secure, the competencies required by hackers to go out there and uh, you know, deploy the most complex uh, attack. So that's the kind of complexity we are seeing, the advancement we are seeing um, with respect to use of technology. Now, coming back to India, I, th I think India is a digital society. It already is a digital society because the last mile today is connected by technology and using technology for their livelihood. And, uh, and I don't think today any company or any government with um, with a strong level of confidence or surety say that they are fully protected because cybersecurity is a moving goal. I think the focus has to be on building that resilience. You have to build your defense, you have to build your resilience because at some point in time, there are gonna be breaches, there are gonna be attacks. Um, how soon and how well we recover is, is, is what it should be becoming more and more important. Um, I think India is taking the right steps. I mean, one, there is a lot of focus right now on building not just digital literacy, but responsible use of technology at the grassroots. What, you know, it's, it's becoming a part of the core curriculum, digital literacy curriculum in India. Um, how do you use technology safely? What do you do or what do you, just like in school we are taught well, in India, we are taught to look left and then look right and before we cross the street. Similarly, um, what are those steps that you have to ensure before you navigate the digital world? I think one, the, the, just the, the simple things, creating that awareness at the grassroots becomes important. Two, ensuring that the infrastructure that powers India's transformation to a digital economy is the digital public infrastructure that the government and industry is building out. Ensuring that security by design becomes um, an imperative for the digital public infrastructures where the first layer is the secure layer that gets built in. And you know, there's a lot of good learning that has come out of Aadhaar, our digital identity card, a billion point two of us have digital identity cards, um, digital identity, sorry. So um, I think a lot of these steps, the security by design is, is getting built into it. As an industry, um, India is still largely a hybrid model. You know, post-COVID, more than 50, 60% of our employees are still working from home. So this becomes very important. It becomes challenging and important for us because when we think of cybersecurity in the past, we have always thought about the perimeter of the enterprise. Now we have to think about the employee's home ecosystem. We have to think about the partner's ecosystem. And how do you ensure resilience carries through all of that? So the enterprises are now are dispersed and you're looking at threats coming in you from different yeah. quarters. Absolutely. But let me, since you mentioned employees, let me talk to you about another a uh, facet that the report brought out, uh, only 15% of all organizations are optimistic that cyber skills and educations will, uh, education will significantly improve in the next two years, and 52% of public organizations state that a lack of resources and skills is the biggest challenge, challenge when designing cyber resilience. Uh, how is it uh, faring out in India now? The biggest challenge is, the, is time, it's the pace. The pace at which technology is evolving, the pace at which the risk landscape is evolving, it becomes pretty much impossible to keep up with that pace using traditional educational processes. You can't. You can't wait for five years for someone to get trained. That's not gonna happen. I think what we are doing in India is figuring out how do you disrupt that entire process. So for example, um, and it's not just the work, the, the, the potential workforce, it is also upskilling the existing workforce. This, the job of the CISO or the role of the CISO has completely changed. So how do you upskill as well as reskill uh, for what is needed today? So few things very quickly that I'll talk about um, in reskilling or in, in building the talent pool. Shorter courses, 
For example, NASCOM is working with government and Microsoft uh, to train women in tier two, tier three cities in India on a short one year course that has been built by experts. Uh, and and you know, in the last one or two years, we've trained around 2000 plus women. Nearly all of them have got employed. Mm -hmm. That's the demand, right? So short courses, look at different talent pools, uh, change the, uh, the system in our education in the universities where uh, the government has now, the regulator has now agreed to give credits to industry curriculum straight away. So that shortens the time required to develop curriculum because industry already has curriculum. They are bringing it in, they are getting the credits and all of that works. And on upskilling the existing, you know, just as the cyber attackers are using fraud GPT, I think it's time we started thinking about how to catch up. We have to build models that act as security experts and work with everyone from developer to the last line to ensure that the security protocols get ingrained into everything they do. Mm -hmm. We can, do not have the time and ability to train every single employee to become a security expert, and that's the need of the hour. So defense GPT, that could be uh, a, a new product. Yep. NASCOM comes out with. <laughs> Sherry, let me turn to you. Um, geopolitics is important, yeah. and conflicts are now common. In, in the last, in this decade, you know, this very long decade that's lasted just four years or three and a half years. <laughs> we are now well into the third or fourth conflict. Uh, what are the learnings for you as someone who studies cybersecurity, cyber resilience uh, in a university ecosystem? What are the learnings from, say, the Ukraine conflict? Uh, how did that implicate or impact the, the digital realm? And, and what, can be, what can be done uh, to, to prepare uh, enterprises and, and countries uh, from the fallouts of such occurrences? Thank you, good question. I guess the first thing that we should be mindful of is that there has been a cyber element to most conflict for many years. But what we've witnessed in the Ukraine was a particularly rapid scale up um, and partnership between private industry and public um, to help bolster defenses and and um, that would have had many elements, of course, and um, one of which moving essential digital assets out of the conflict, out of the theater of conflict and into the cloud. And there's some lessons we need to think about there. Um, but also what we've learned from, from stepping back and speaking to people that were involved is, is the essential nature of the partnership between um, business that have the tools, that have the infrastructure and, and the ability to help change these defensive postures rapidly, um, and um, those charged with um, public sector funding of it, et cetera. And we're told that in the Ukraine example, the pre-existing relationships that existed were essential. So there's a lesson we can take away there um, if we're thinking about how to prepare to rapidly bolster cyber defenses in the face of conflict in other parts of the world, then we must make sure that we have already invested in the relationships, the networks, that will, will enable us to change the nature of that cooperation and that communication so that, so that what happens in the cyber defense can happen quickly. Um, we mustn't underestimate the essential nature of business here um, and there will be a temptation for us as an international community to start thinking about the processes we can put in place to make sure that we can support each other and defend each other's public infrastructures in other cases. And, and we must always bear in mind that whatever we do there, we do not damage our ability to be agile mm -hmm. um, um, in the face of, of this kind of need. So I think that's the key lesson. We need. We need to have invested in the relationships, and we need to make sure whatever we do in terms of public, private, private, mm -hmm. public cooperation support, we protect our agility. Yeah. So let me ask you a what if. What if, and, and listen, I'm, I'm not an advocate of any of this. This is just a what if question. What if we were to see a pandemic scale event in the digital sector, affecting yeah. the clouds and affecting key service providers? or maybe even a financial crisis that happened in 2008, that scale kind of a, uh, occurrence. Yes. Can we respond? Can, is the world cooperating enough 
to be able to bring all systems back online? <laughs> and what can be done to be ready to do that? Gosh, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Well, we know, don't we? We've known for some time there is cyber risk. It's likely to be systemic. It's likely to be aggregating. We don't fully understand the nature of that. So it's a bit of an iceberg. We can see the peak of it. We don't really understand what's below the waterline. But we are, as a community, many of us, cooperating, trying to build the foresight, the simulations, the scenarios that would enable us to begin to anticipate this. Um, at Oxford, we've been working on some agent-based simulations, and um, we don't have access to all of the data. But what it's telling us is there is an issue. And even when we come up with good estimates, we can see certain scenarios um, where you might see a portion of the cloud going down, a portion of the energy infrastructure coming down, and the consequences for that could be quite significant. And if you start modeling in policy decisions, which may be we need to protect these kinds of organizations, these sectors, the consequences for those that are not protected can rapidly become very significant. So yes, there's a really important call to action here. Um, we should be mindful of this. Um, it's, it feels to me like the, the potential consequence, the cost of it, will be beyond any particular organization's capabilities. capital reserves. Yeah, but I think we have other colleagues on the panel that we're going to speak to that. No, but I want to bring in the Global South here. Yes. Again, taking a, taking a lesson from the pandemic, the Global South was largely left to their own devices. And you had countries that received the first shot of the vaccine a year later from, say, Europe or America or even India, for example. Uh, how do we include the Global South and, and the fastest growing digital uh, geographies in the South uh, in our plans for resilience, for building international partnerships and capabilities? Yes, and it's incredibly important, isn't it? Because we know that cyber does not restrict national boundaries Correct. and we are codependent on each other. Um, one of the things um, we, need, we need to do is ensure that we are working together to raise the general baseline and that we understand what that cybersecurity capacity baseline should be. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to be cyber defense capabilities. It's never just about technology, but that is important. And having access to that, having an awareness of how to be effective in using it, that's important. But there are other things too, strategy, policy, social mindset, the ability for leaders of business, as well as government, as well as people that are managing their homes, their local communities, environments, all of that needs investing in, as well as law and regulation and support for the rule of law. Um, these, when you, when you unpack all of those areas, they're all codependent. There's complexity mm -hmm. in, in cybersecurity capacity, but working together, understanding what the minimal baselines are, will enable us to build trust with each other at, at national level, at business level, at community level. And that trust is essential to underpin the kind of cooperation which is needed. And the responses that will be required to bring it all right. back. Right, yes. Thank you. Uh, John, um, the recently launched Global Risk Report at the, at the forum yet again sees cyber insecurity as both a prominent risk over a two-year time frame and a 10-year time frame. In your assessment, what has changed in the last year? Have we progressed? Has it become worse? <laughs> well, thank you. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Uh, no surprise to us, we've been working with the forum over uh, the last 20 years in producing that report. And over that period of time, cyber risk has been working its way up to the top of the list each and every year. And what I can tell you is that that data confirms you know, what we see as the largest insurance broker in the world and global risk advisor uh, in the world in the conversations that we're having uh, with our clients. It is top of mind. It's um, on the top of most risk registers for, for businesses around the world. And it's absolutely clear that the geopolitical environment, all the complexity of today's geopolitical environment is making that risk um, higher and higher. The last couple of years that have been really kind of responding to ransomware mm -hmm. um, and what that meant, both in the insurance market and helping our clients be risk ready, um, put mitigation steps in place um, to understand how to respond to those types of attack. Um, today, it's big concerns about how um, systemic events might impact their business. And I think not just the global south, I think um, in most developed economies around the world, Governments certainly and big business are not prepared um, for those types of systemic events, be it cyber terror, 
a, a power grid coming down, a cloud service provider coming down, whatever the scenario is, mm -hmm. um, we're not prepared for that. And, and while it's been working, while this risk has been working its way up the list over the course of the last um, 10 to 20 years, um, to me, the fight is just beginning. It's an arms race. There's no question about that. And AI is going to amplify um, that race and the risks for both sides. I don't see it as one side having an advantage over the other, um, but it's quite clear. I think the fact that it's on top of mind for business and government is absolutely terrific. Um, we're much more risk aware today. And we've all gotten spoiled by what technology can do for us. We don't walk out of our house without locking the door. Right? We need to be very mindful of what mm -hmm. this risk means to our business, what it means to us as individuals um, as well. And so, um, so from, my, from my perspective, we're just at the beginning of the fight. You know, I, I want to speak to you about the role of cyber insurance. Sure. And how it in enhances resilience. Yep. And perhaps how it also creates exclusions because the premium costs are rising. Sure. So uh, it's only certain sorts of enterprises who can afford right. uh, what the industry offers. Yeah. So how, how are we rethinking insurance at scale uh, and to cover geographies, as uh, Sadie mentioned, that you know there's no north and south when it comes to the digital architecture. Uh, how do you create affordable insurance? Uh, and by the way, uh, affordable uh, drivers of, of enterprises investing in resilience. Yeah. Because insurance in some sense is also a way of to drive market behavior. It is, we send signals, right, right. to, you know, to, to customers and, and to governments about where they are, you know, in terms of risk readiness. And so I think those are, are really important signals. In fact, we start the dialogue with our clients um, with a cyber self-assessment tool. And that gives them a sense right away of how they stack up you know, in that particular geography, the industry that they're in, um, and their ability to actually get insurance. There, there are segments of certain industries that um, won't be able to get insurance today because they're not prepared and not ready. And so I think those are important signals um, for, uh, for business and governments to, uh, to, to get. And I think that the industry um, plays a really important role. It starts from self-assessment um, to working with um, security providers around the world to help them begin to mitigate um, or prepare to mitigate potential risks and also to be ready to respond in the case of an event and a lot of scenario planning around um, what those types of events might mean, the decisions you might need, being prepared with the right advisors to be able to navigate um, those types of events. Um, but what I, you know, what, I can what I can tell you about the cyber insurance market, after the last couple of years where prices, no, no question, were on the rise, um, really in response to the explosion of mm -hmm. ransomware claims um, working into the market. The market's adjusted to that. Granted, off of highs, um, prices are actually now coming down slightly. Um, so there's some good news there. The bad news, um, though, is that insurers and reinsurers who help support the aggregation of risks mm -hmm. in, the, in the market are very, very worried about these systemic types of events and how they might aggregate in their portfolio. So they're being responsible stewards of their capital we're in the business of making commitments. Insurers are making commitments. They want to be there and be able to pay. I mean, they're saying, hey, in certain um, cat-type scenarios, uh, we cannot finance that. In fact, it's easy looking at the pandemic and modeling certain types of cyber risk scenarios uh, to see that these scenarios um, way, um, are way larger than mm -hmm. what the industry um, could finance. And so we're, we're investing quite a bit in modeling. We are also trying to bring new investors in um, to increase the capacity of the industry. But we're also spending time working with governments. Um, I think um, there's a real opportunity here for public-private partnerships. Again, I think we can help with good um, risk hygiene and we can finance parts of the risk. Um, but governments need to be prepared because candidly, I think ultimately, those that are most unprepared and most uninsured or not insured at all are gonna be SMEs, much mm -hmm. like we saw in the pandemic. And so that risk is gonna ultimately fall on the balance sheet of governments. On the public sector. Correct. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that in the next round and I'm gonna ask all of you on, on public sector funding as well as public sector planning for uh, these big events. But Gary, let me turn to you. You've spoken a lot about resiliency and cybersecurity and um, knowing that most uh, companies and, and, and folks are thinking about um, cyber insecurity as, uh, as a big concern area. What are the major cyber trends you foresee uh, in the year ahead and, and how do organizations need to think about these trends? 
Yeah, I think um, as we enter 24, I think uh, there's a lot of concern to be had. You have this confluence of events. You've got two active conflicts, one other potential large conflict ongoing. You've got an election cycle in the U.S. that, and if you just go back to our last election cycle, we saw an, a high increase in threat activity as related to that. Um, and so all of those factors, and then you have the ransomware actors that continue to um, be winning. And so you've got a confluence of all these factors that, that ultimately will drive a very complicated and concerning threat environment that we all have to deal with. Now, the thing I'm very optimistic about is a lot of the investments that have been made, the maturity that has happened, the awareness that has happened, has really raised the posture of private industry and governments uh, about the importance of this. And so while I'm optimistic over the long term, I think in 24, we have to be very thoughtful and be very vigilant because it's gonna, I think it's gonna be a really tough year on the cyber front. Mm -hmm. and, you know, as we look at um, the cyber divide and the conversation about SMEs, you know, it's been interesting to have a whole, I've had a whole set of conversations while I've been here. The one thing that's encouraging to me is cyber has seen an, an amazing amount of innovation. And if you look at the number of cybersecurity companies today, you know, we, we went from a handful 20 years ago to thousands today. And someone can say that that's bad, but at, the, at a holistic level, that's a lot of dollars and people focused on innovation to help defend both private enterprise and government. Yeah. And so while we have a long ways to go, that innovation will ultimately help us. And I think we're gonna see innovation that allows prices to come down so that we can get to more organizations. I think AI will be a facilitator to help Organizations that just don't have the bandwidth, the, the, all of the skills needed, it's gonna get easier. It's gonna get easier to defend. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic over the long term and I just feel like we've gotta be very thoughtful in the short term because I think it's gonna be a tough year. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, you have also spoken about leadership in boardrooms. Um, you know, there's a, a SEC rule on now cyber incident disclosure, but many countries around the world are now wanting more accountable boardrooms yeah. when it comes to um, many of these incidents. Uh, what is the role of leadership in navigating the risks that you just mentioned? And, and, and you know, I'm going to, this is a question to you, Gary, but I want to come to all of you. Are people more willing to disclose cyber incidents today than they were, say, a few years ago, including nations? And I will come, I'll come to you, Secretary General, as well on that. But Gary, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and we could probably spend a number of days talking about this topic. But at, at a very simple level, I think um, the great thing that has happened is, as we've discussed and the, the panelists have mentioned, there is broader awareness today in, at leadership level, in boardrooms, this is a top priority. So it, it is a topic of conversation. So that's, that's a huge advancement, frankly, from where we were even five years ago. So that is progress. Now, these SEC rules, I think, draw the requirement around um, timely disclosure. It's still a little confusing to me in that we have these rules, but there's no requirement from the SEC to have cyber expertise on a board. Hmm. Yeah. And so, th so think <laughs> about the world that we live in with, we have a well understood finance process where you are required to have a, have a set of financial experts on your board. And those financial experts, there's a definition of what that means. Correct. And so we haven't, we haven't gotten there. Um, so yes, there's been progress. And yes, I think people say we should have a cyber expert, but they haven't quite figured it out. And so I think there's m room for maturity and improvement in the boardroom as it relates to having a true understanding and, and frankly, a level of accountability to, uh, to... And do you think that is something the insurance industry could enforce? That you get insured if you have experts sitting in, in, in the leadership team? Go ahead. You're the expert. <laughs> no, well, I, expert. We, 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 I don't think our industry, you know, be careful about speaking uh, up. Look, industry has speaking always said norms entire industry. outside well, we don't, the public. We don't see our role as enforcement, okay? Yeah. But we send signals, right? Correct. So, um, so having that level of expertise inside a firm is, Brings a, down the is a data point, you know, amongst many data points about, you know, a company's risk awareness and their risk readiness, right? So, okay. certainly. So now and, I, and I want to go back to, but I want to just finish the, the, the other part of the question, which is on this transparency discussion around reporting. So, you know, I view the SEC rule ultimately as a good thing, right? It does bring a level of transparency that is important. And I think, 
overall, the more transparency that we can drive, the better off we are because we can help each other, we can drive better cooperation. Transparency res will result in better outcomes for everybody. It can be painful in the moment. Obviously, it's incredibly painful, but um, transparency, I think, is a benefit. And if you talk to CISOs, if we had a whole set of CISOs in the room, they would be advocating for transparency. So if you have vulnerabilities in the software supply chain, what do you want? You want transparency so you can respond. Because the comments earlier about agility, agility comes from transparency. Mm -hmm. You know what's going on, you can, you can defend, you can move, you can make good decisions. So I'm an advocate for that. Um, we have lots of maturity to have happen, but it's a step in the right direction. So I'm going to ask uh, all of you, uh, Sadie, you want to come in on this? Yes, um, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And actually, when it comes to um, boards and senior leadership, um, we have to move, don't we, from transparency to situational awareness. What we're really talking about Great. is knowing the security posture of your organization, having an intuition for risk, understanding when you hear something, when you're presented with something that's a form of cyber intelligence or you've read it in your favorite online newspaper or, or for those of us that's really old in, in, on the paper version, knowing is this something I have to respond to straight away or is this something I can um, push back to the weekend? But <laughs> leadership set tone and culture. You cannot expect all of the people working in your organizations to follow really good cyber practice if your leaders aren't doing it. Correct. That's yeah. that, number one. Number two, my guess is the best organizations have some kind of cyber expertise. They may well be advisors to the board. They may be NEDs. But, uh, Given the level at which we're seeing the threat develop, the pace at which um, technology is evolving, the pace at which the threat ecosystem is evolving to harness the benefits of the technology, and in another discussion we'll talk about how we harness that for defense. I don't think it's conceivable that we can live with one member of the boardroom being cyber fit. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has to. Mm -hmm. Everybody can understand financial risk. They are going to have to understand cyber risk. Cyber risk and financial risk are going to be closely coupled in the future. And the way in which I see this is we look after our health. We look after our physical health. We look after our mental health. And investing in cyber risk fitness amongst our senior leadership is something that we need to help them do. They need to raise their awareness levels. They've got to have the tools. We've got to deliver the tools mm -hmm. to enable them to do that. And they do need to look to their personal cybersecurity. I think there'll be there's going to be a moment where some of these AI-enabled deep fake tools, mm -hmm. that's going to converge with the ransomware attacks and the level of training data that's available on people that are in the public eye, mm -hmm. I think we can expect to see some of our senior leaders being very highly targeted in the coming year or two. We've seen, we've seen an incident yes. in India already. But um, uh, let me turn to Jürgen. Jürgen, you mentioned 8 to 30% of the incidents are disclosed. Are people still embarrassed telling others about what happened to them? Is there still a shame associated with being uh, a victim of, of cyber theft, cyber crime, cyber incident, cyber terrorism? Yeah, I mean, there might be um, uh, different reasons why people are not reporting to the police. Uh, maybe embarrassment is a, still a point. Maybe um, they do not exactly know what the police is doing or the prosecutor is doing. They might think we, we, we pull the plug and we, we stop the machinery which of course is not the case. So, so law enforcement also has to do more to, to inform, for instance, private sector, what would happen in case of a, re a reporting of such a crime. Let me, for just for a minute, um, leave the, the perspective of a, of a boardroom and individual company. I think what we have to jointly consider is the architecture of security. So what do I mean? It's not something esoterian, it's something very pragmatic. How do we organize ourselves in public sector, private sector, and, and building the bridges on a national level, on a regional level, and on a global level, because mm -hmm. that is what the threat requires. It's also required because we have limited resources, and it's because what today pops up in one part of the world will be tomorrow in the other part of the world. So I think many countries, uh, even in the, in the so-called developed world, are still struggling how to work against fragmentation, because that is a major risk in, in effectively pushing cybercrime back. So, Interesting models are coming up. For instance, I, I know it qu quite well from Singapore. They have an anti-scam center where people from public sector and from private sector are sitting every day desk by desk 
and sharing in real time information. That is the level what we need. We are doing the same in Interpol with a gateway project, also in Singapore in our Global Hub for Innovation, where we're sitting with some representatives from global players um, mm -hmm. in the private sector every day uh, and, and sharing in real time based on a proper legal framework information. And a lot is going on in Africa, in South America currently, those centers are being built and we have to work together. We need the, the support from the private sector um, to, to build a most effective global architecture because you cannot fix that problem just on a, on a national level or on a regional mm -hmm. level. You need, we all know that, it's a global problem and it requires a globally coordinated response mm -hmm. and there's a lot to do in that and Interpol stands ready to work with the private sector on that. Look, I'm going to turn to you, uh, you folks now if you want to come in, a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, but before I conclude, I'm going to ask you all the final question from my side as we close the panel. How can cyber defenders win? That was a question of the panel. I want you to give short answers on how can we win. One thing that we should be thinking about doing in 2024 to, to turn the tide. Uh, the lady here, can I have the mic here, please? The, is there a, please. And please get my attention. I'll come to you as well. If someone else wants to pose a question. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Really insightful. I'm Susana. I'm from Chile, Latin America. I have been working in these topics in Latin America, but what do you think if this is a big talent for the European Union, for US, for India, for, for big countries, what do you think about these topics in emerging countries and specifically in the supply chain? Because uh, even big companies are struggling with this. So what is going to happen with all the suppliers mm -hmm. and what is going to happen if they are not able to to jump in this that they are going to be left out of the market or, or what do you think or what do you recommend actually uh, any other question from the audience yeah, yeah Go ahead. cls uh, financial market infrastructure you mentioned transparency but you didn't mention uh, a condition for reconnection when you are in a network and there is a transparency the first thing you do is to disconnect we saw it recently uh, in the treasury market in US, huh? um, but the condition to reconnect are important and the more work we do in advance, I see the better we will be. Okay, so we have two questions. One is uh, smaller companies, supply chains, and how do you build capacities for them to invest in resilience and, and how, do you, how do they protect themselves? Uh, and sub of course, the, the connections for reconditioned transparency and, and response frameworks. Uh, but please, as we now go down the panel, we will also respond to that one thing we can do so that uh, cyber defenders can win. So Gary, let me start with you and then turn, come to Jürgen. Okay, let me start on transparency. Um, I look at um, some of the events that we've had in the software supply chain like SolarWinds. Um, the earlier people found out about it, the more that they could do. And so just the time to respond and, and agility, and while that transparency has implications associated with it, we've got to figure out how to get through that because we have to collectively as an industry and governments all have to collectively respond. So the faster and more transparent people are, the better off we're going to be. And my answer on how can defenders can win, we all need, need to do the basics well. Okay. Just do the basics well. <laughs> I think the bad guys are better organized in many ways um, than the good guys, right? So we talked about um, disclosure requirements and transparency. Um, we're certainly working and trying to do our part around aggregating that data and using it um, in ineff effective ways. But governments are also now, many governments that are requiring re reporting are aggregating a tremendous amount of data. We've got to press public officials to help us learn um, from that data so we can improve security. Sidi. Um, Yes, and um, make sure that our senior leaderships um, are, are cyber fit, can deal with the risk. Supercharge our cyber defense by using AI, and, and there's lots we can do there that we're not doing currently, although we're doing a lot. Um, and then finally, both for single organizations and supply chains, don't assume the perimeters will hold. Mm -hmm. Get used to doing insider threat detection and get good at threat hunting. Don't wait. Try and get, get there first. Being proactive. Yes. Divjani. Uh, you know, I think AI is going to be absolutely fundamental to cybersecurity. Um, and it's going to provide game-changing capabilities to whoever uses it, the good guys and the bad guys. Um, I think it's going to be important to fight AI with AI. So 
companies, governments have to build capabilities to use the technology well, not just to build cyber resilience, but also to address this tremendously important point of uh, so technology as the gap. antidote yeah. and, and skill people to make yeah. it happen. Yeah. I mean, crime always did exist and will always exist, so it's about the reducing um, the risk. That is the, the key, um, of course, as I said earlier, building an effective um, architecture of security, institutionalized cooperation. It, it requires a holistic approach, and I, I agree. Uh, artificial intelligence used in an ethical way is a huge opportunity for, for law enforcement to provide for more effective deterrence and, and prosecution, because bringing the criminal behind bars is an important part of fighting cybercrime. Thank you so much. We have run out of time, but uh, my only final comments and thoughts, cyber defenders must win. It is important for us. Uh, please join me in applauding the wonderful panel for their contributions. And uh, <laughs> see you next time, next year at Davos.